following interview was conducted with Professor Emeritus Robert Landau for of Health Professor Emeritus of Health Sciences Robert Landau for the Purdue University Horror History Program. It took place on Monday, July 14, 2008 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Thank you. Tell us a little about where you were born and your parents in early years. Well, I was born in Sherman, Texas. It's north of Dallas, about 60 miles, in 1937. And my uh, father was a chemistry professor at a small church-related college there in Sherman, Austin College. And our house was next to the campus, so I grew up in academia from the very beginning. And uh, actually went to high school there in Sherman and went to college there. Got my uh, BS degree in physics and math. They had a double major in those days uh, in 1959. Tell and us a little bit about high school. How large a school and what were your activities? Sherman and was about uh, 30,000. Um, a nice town, a nice sized town. The high school got one high school. I think there was 150 in, in my graduating class. So it was a good sized school. We had our 50th reunion. Uh, How many uh, came? Uh, quite a few come back. Uh, well, let's see. We had a. 50, I graduated in '55 from yeah. high school. Yeah. College in '59. Yeah. Yeah. There was an uh, amazing number that came back, and this would be 2005. Sure. Somewhere around 90. That was pretty good. A number of them had stayed in that North Texas area. So, but yeah, that's pretty good. It sure is. That's more than half of the. It's still around. Class were around 50 years after graduation. Sure. So that was fun. Yeah. That was a good time. Tell us a little about college. What was the name of the school and what Austin was your major? Austin College, church-related college. Um, uh, math and physics uh, were my majors then. Did um, you live in, on campus or? Some of the time. Some of the time I lived at home. Okay. Um, so, uh, but I never did live in the dorm. I lived in an apartment uh, you know, when I became an upperclassman. It was a good school. Mm -hmm. uh, what activities were you involved in? Uh, basketball, clubs? tennis, uh, sports. Mm -hmm. Had a little scholarship in basketball. Um, How'd your team fact, do? Well, we did good. We were um, NAIA, which is, you know, it's not, not an NCAA, but it's a well-organized, small college, uh, nationwide. It still, uh, still goes, too. Yeah. Sure. And... Uh, they have, I think, 32 districts. The U.S. is divided into 32 districts, and for the first time, our and, and the way they do it, uh, in contrast to the NCAA, they have a winner from each district, and they all go to Kansas City at one time and play as the tournament there, all 32 teams. So for the first time in the history of the college, our, our basketball team got to go. We got yeah. beat the first game. <laughs> but, but it was nice to experience. But, but yeah, nice yeah. to go to Kansas City. Yeah. Sure. So, and we did that my junior and senior year. Well, so good. That was fun. Yeah. yeah. And what were some of the buildings like? Was it a, a campus quite, is it an average size campus, medium size? It's uh, an enrollment of about a thousand in those days. So it was pretty good size for it's a small co -ed. liberal arts co-ed uh -huh. uh, Christian college that uh, uh, had a broad variety of majors. Um, campus was nice. My father was involved during the Depression in keeping the college alive because he, he was a career professor there and from about 1920 on. He what was, was it? Does he share what he meant? What was it like during the Depression? Were there it was terrible. Oh. Uh, particularly for higher education, you know, uh, many of them uh, just died. Uh, and he... The, en the enrollment must have been affected, too. Yeah, the enrollment was affected. Uh, he was able to keep the college going. He became treasurer and business manager as well as chemistry professor. He was able to keep the college going by working with farmers who wanted to, in North Texas, who wanted to send their kids to college, and so they would provide food sure. for the college, for the dining hall. And that was a kind of a, you know, interesting approach he had. 
right. in place of tuition, they provide food. Sure. And Which was he'd much pay the, And not only that, he'd pay the cooks <laughs> and uh, the custodians with food <laughs> instead of cash. Sure. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I, but they survived. I was born it. after the depression, so I don't yeah. remember. But you hear. I just know from talking to my father and mother, it was rough. Sure. Uh, and then World War II came along, and that hurt the enrollment. So, but they survived, and it's a very good college now. Yeah. I imagine well one, endowed now. One of the, yeah, the endowment and also fin they provide financial aid. Of course, that's a change oh, for yeah, Harvard over the years. Right. They, have a lot of support now. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Well, tell us then after after commencement, then what was the next step? Well, I took a job at a. You major majored in physics and didn't really know what I wanted to go into, except in the back of my mind I wanted to teach, but I wasn't ready to uh, go on to graduate school. I was kind of tired of school at the time, so I took a job at a hospital in Houston, which was pioneering in radiation, use of radiation to treat cancer. It's actually more than, it's called MD Anderson Cancer and Tumor Research Institute, but commonly just called MD Anderson Hospital. Still there, still doing really cutting edge research sure. in right. cancer therapy. And it was endowed by a wealthy cotton broker named MD Anderson, so they had good funding. And they were buying uh, some accelerators, uh, cobalt 60 units, really, as I said, cutting edge work. And, and note for those days. I had, hadn't experienced any of that in Austin College. It was too small to have, you know, accelerators and, and some of the newer machines. So it was really a great experience. It was an eye opener to me uh, to go there and work. And it was such a large hospital, they actually had a physics department. <laughs> Because it's a teaching hospital, research and treatment. So it's actually now it's part of the University of Texas. Oh, is that system. where the tie-in is now? At the okay. time, it was not, but n somehow now it, they they're part of the teaching system of the University of Texas. I've known people from here that have gone down there. Yeah, too, it's you know. uh, and I worked there under a woman who had just received her PhD in physics from MIT and was just really, uh, you know, tremendous person to work under because she was getting into studying um, the effects of radiation when, on bone marrow and, in other words, when a person's treated for cancer with radiation, say for a tumor, uh, how is it going to affect the bone marrow which produces red blood cells? Right. So. She was doing what we call dosimetry, early dosimetry work on what happens between the bone and the marrow. When radiation hits the bone, it's going to kick out a lot of electrons into the marrow and that damage the marrow. And that's, you know, that was my first taste of radiation work. At the same time, there, were, there was nobody trained in protecting the the nurses and the doctors, and no, really not much training what about in were, health were physics. They, were they not trained for the X? Because X ray was here. They, was they, were they, they were, were well, they or were, or there was uh, a certain amount of knowledge about X ray machines, but we're talking about much more powerful oh, sure. Understand. Uh, accelerators that uh, operate in a different uh, energy level. and. And there just uh, was a need for people to go into this new area, uh, relatively new area called health physics, radiation safety. I never even heard of the word health physics in college, but yeah. when I got to MD Anderson, because nobody else could do it, the physicists who weren't really trained in it had to do the radiation safety. And in other words, when they would design a uh, and they were all the time putting in new Piece machines. When they would design the shielding of the room, uh, this became what's called radiation physics or health physics. And, uh, sure, they knew it for x-ray machines, but that's pretty simple. You put up a little piece of lead. And, mm -hmm. But now you're talking about needing five, four or five feet of concrete in the walls, much more strong shielding. And 
these were pioneers that I got to work with there. And that, had they, and that advertised, sort of gave me, had they advertised for this, or how did you, you sort of lucked out, maybe? Um, I, my uh, advisor at Austin College knew, he, he knew that I was, I had taken modern, or what's called, what was called nuclear physics, or modern physics, uh, as a senior level <coughs> course, and he, I think he saw the interest I had in, in radiation physics, even though I hadn't, they didn't have anything to work with there, at least I could read about it. And he knew uh, a person in the physics department at MD Anderson, and basically right. hooked me up there. And I took some courses at Rice University while I was there in a good school. Um, but I was only there for maybe six months when I read a, a notice on the the uh, bulletin board in the hospital that the what's now called the what was then called the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission, the old AEC. Uh, now it's split into the NRC and the Department of Energy. But in those days, the Atomic Energy Commission did was did everything. They regulated regulated and they developed right. and uh, of course that split was became apparent that you needed to split the regulators from them. but the AEC this would be in the about 1959 uh, had just started a fellowship program in health physics and they were desperate for radiation safety, ed well-educated, well-trained health physicists, radiation safety types to go into places like Oak Ridge, Savannah River, where the weapons programs were, 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 going not, out. were beginning, you know, was, were in the middle of the Cold War. And, and then nuclear power plants were be just beginning to be designed, and uh, there was a need you know, for health physicists, so the government started this wonderful fellowship program called the Atomic Energy Commission Fellowship. So I applied and and uh, there were nine schools I think at the time and I didn't know Purdue was one of them but I didn't know anything about Purdue at the time but I knew a little bit about Kansas University it was closer to home. So I chose, you had your choice which of the nine schools that the AEC felt were qualified you know, to even have a graduate. Sure. It's a master's program. I chose Kansas, I packed everything in my car, <laughs> left the hospital in the middle of Christmas break and uh, started the second semester there at University of Kansas in Lawrence in a department called Radiation Biophysics. And the uh, head of the department there was a long time uh, um, expert in radium and the old problems with radium were very, he went way back into the 20s and 30s and had done a lot of work with the watch dial painters, I don't know if you're familiar with that, the women who would put the, or paint in New Jersey would paint with radium so it would glow in the dark, watch dials. And many of them, of course, died of yeah, cancer, yeah. horrible bone cancer. Uh, and he was in on the uh, autopsies of, of these women and was able to get bone samples and to study the, the uh, radiation in their bone and to try to understand why it was so damaging. And I actually did my master's degree on a uh, bone sample of a woman from New Jersey who had died of radium poison. And I did my master's degree under this Dr. Hecker in uh, Kansas, but that the, most of the training there was in radiation safety, you know, because the AEC required certain courses to be offered, and that was a that was a good time too. Uh, mm -hmm. How many were in the program? Well, actually, there were. It was a small little building there, uh, it's sort of been thrown up hastily. Um, it r reminded me of our bionicleonics department, which I'll get into later, which sure. for quite a while, you know, was in a small, sure. Quons not Quonset Hut, but one of the uh, buildings that were built right after World War II, 
to do. Um, it was a small building like that, uh, maybe three professors, and the only ones on campus who knew anything really about radiation. And, <laughs> they were but all housed. There were probably, there were maybe 10 uh, students who'd come from on this fellowship, suddenly just came there. And the military sent, I'd say there was another 10 from the Army, Navy, I think um, maybe somebody from the Coast Guard, but mainly Army, Navy, because um, they were trying to train sure. guys. So they actually took advantage of this new program, even though they're DOD, and they, they were classmates of mine mm -hmm. there at Kansas. And part of the requirement of that program was a very good idea. You finish your coursework, you finish your research, but they wouldn't allow the school, or this was the agreement, the school could not grant the master's degree until the summer after you finished everything. You had to go to a national laboratory for three months internship and actually work. And of course what they were hoping was that after you got to the national lab, they would you'd get a job there sure, to stay with the sure. stay with the government. Didn't have to, but uh, I did actually. But they they it was a part of the requirement, and so again you had your choice of going to any of the national labs. I could have gone to Oregon, or, you know, in Chicago, Brookhaven, Los Alamos, uh, Lawrence Livermore. You had your choice, and I chose. I was getting interested in reactors. There wasn't a reactor at Kansas at that time, but I was getting interested in reactor health physics, the specific area dealing with reactor safety. And so I chose to go to Idaho, which at that time was called the National Reactor Testing Station, NRTS. And they were building all kinds of reactors out on the desert in Idaho and testing it. It's a pretty isolated place uh, for a reason. <laughs> and so uh, I spent three years there and actually I satisfied the summer requirement, got my degree, but then Phyllis Petroleum Company was actually the contractor at the time and I got a job offer there so I stayed there and I learned a tremendous amount of invaluable experience there uh, working with people who were developing all kinds of reactors. And, uh, we had, uh, ne we never had bad accidents. I, actually, there was a bad accident called the SL1 accident that had occurred the winter before I got there. And I was involved in the cleanup of the SL1 which three men died, not from radiation, but from uh, projectiles. It was a steam explosion, and I did a lot of work in helping in the cleanup of that and burying everything and, sure. and uh, just That's learned. an important part of the process. Just learned a lot of, of uh, you know, health physics that you can't learn anywhere else. The hands-on. The hands-on, yeah, you got it. So that was a good experience. I worked mainly at uh, a reactor called the Materials Testing Reactor, MTR, and this was a reactor that was built in order to irradiate all kinds of, of things to see the effect of radiation. And most of our contracts were with the U.S. Navy because they were developing the nuclear submarine program then, and they wanted to see how the reactor in the sub would damage uh, things like semiconductors and transistors that were, you know, important. So they they actually had a uh, submarine out in the desert, <laughs> full-scale submarine sitting out in the desert. And they, I never was got into that facility because it was so secure. But they would bring parts over to us, you know, to irradiate in the MTR. Sure. And, <laughs> and uh, uh, so that. You know, I, I just, and we had some uh, minor accidents there, and that's where the health physics, like you say, the hands-on experience, which 
actually we'll talk about in a moment came in handy here sure. at Purdue. Right. Uh, Were you married at that time? No, it oh. wasn't. Uh -huh. uh, I actually, in, my father went out to Taiwan to do some educational missionary work for our church, and he was so he was teaching chemistry at a Christian college in Taiwan, and. In 1964, which would be the third year I was there, it had been gnawing on me that I wanted, after I finished my master's degree, I thought, okay, I'm not going to go any further. <laughs> but I'll it kept gnawing on me that I, I really did want to teach. And so I began to think about going somewhere for a PhD. And, um, uh, well, I can tell that story first okay. and then get back to my future wife. Um, the the Health Physics Society w was had been formed, and this is our national organization, professional organization. I think it was formed about the time I was in college, and it had grown to maybe a thousand people nationwide. And they began to have annual meetings in the summer, uh, and it, the annual meeting. The summer of 1963 was in Las Vegas, so a bunch of us got in a car and went to Vegas. And so I, I had, I really wasn't uh, clear, you know, whether I really wanted to go back to college or to graduate school. But I was, well, I never forget walking down the hall and uh, passing the placement service. The, the society would always have a placement service for folks at the, could, meeting. at the meeting where folks could advertise. Sure. And there was this little note on the board there: uh, Purdue University is looking for a reactor health physicist, and wow. something like that. And if you're interested, uh, come to room so and so and talk to John Christian, you know, and Paul Zemer. So. I thought, well, Purdue, um, I remembered it was one of the programs that was recognized by the Atomic Energy sure. Commission for graduate work. Um, so I went up, you know, and knocked on the door, and that was the beginning of a you know, life-changing sure. experience for me, because yeah. uh, Dr. Christian happened to be there, and, and he called in Dr. Zemer, and, and um, by the time I'd finished talking with them, I was so impressed with the kind of persons they were and are that um, I really felt a, right away I, I wanted to pursue it. So uh, I think I talked with them a couple more times while I was there. And they, as I recall at the time, they were just looking to hire somebody. Not, But Dr. Christian came up with the idea of because I had told him I wanted, I really wanted to do graduate work toward a PhD because I was really thinking about going into um, trying to become a professor sure. in, in the health physics program. So at the time, Purdue, uh, I don't know whether we still have it, but there was a position called instructorship. And, uh, they don't have any, but I know what you've got. He, people have he said, I'll need to go back and talk to Dean Jenkins about this. At the time, Dr. Christian, as you probably know, was in was really a pharmacist, but became a pharmaceutical chemist and then a radiopharmaceutical chemist. And sure. Got into, and with uh, President Hovde became uh, responsible, uh, President Hovde and, and de designated him to be responsible for the radiation safety at Purdue. And, but that was all housed academically in the pharmacy school. And they had by that time formed the bionucleonics department, which, and a major part of the effort there was in radiation safety training. Uh, but he, w he uh, went back and checked, and they, he wrote me back in Idaho that they could offer me this instructorship. And so I jumped at that. <laughs> yeah, right. And uh, that was just a beginning of uh, my whole career here and working with some really fine people. Um, this allowed you to do your graduate work at the same time? Yeah, the, 
uh, instructorship was kind of unique. I wasn't in a particular hurry to finish because um, I, you know, like some people are sort of under, I guess, different kinds of financial. I mean, they, the salary that I was offered was very good. Uh, not like what I was earning in Idaho, but it was plenty fine. And, and, you know, you could take nine hours towards your degree, credit hours. Uh, you were required to do a good bit of teaching, instructorship, which I wanted to experience doing. You could, uh, uh, and also they made it clear I would need to be involved in the reactor safety place. See, Purdue was just building a reactor at the time. That's why they needed, I didn't mention that, but Purdue had just finished building the reactor over in Duncan Annex and they, you know, they had had consultants who had helped them with the radiation safety, but they felt they really needed a, a Purdue employee responsible for it. On site. On site. And, sure. all, and also the use of radioisotopes at Purdue in the early 60s was just mushrooming, I mean, just, you know, and everywhere it was, in research and teaching. But Purdue was ordering a lot of isotopes, even in the early 60s, from Oak Ridge, and, and then some of the companies began to form that, that started selling them. So they needed somebody to, who had experience in radiation safety, cleaning up spills and approving users, users all of which I'd learned there in addition to the reactor uh, work. So it was a perfect fit for me. Uh, yeah, and then based on the, the fourth thing was your research. <laughs> you know, whatever time you had left, you, of you could work on your research. Right, I understand. So you might, I know how those You might realize I was pretty busy. <laughs> <laughs> but and I, back to my future wife, yeah. right, when I decided to come to Purdue, uh, I, uh, my father and mother were over in Taiwan, and I decided I'd quit my job a little early and go over there and visit them. So I was due here in August of 64 for that semester, and so I, I think I left in May mm -hmm. because, you know, I just wanted to go live with them, see the Orient, and um, my wife was the daughter, my future wife was the daughter of, of uh, close friends of that my folks had met in Taiwan, missionaries in Taiwan in the same church denomination. So my folks knew her folks before we knew each other. So that's when we met. Oh, okay. You met over well, there. Met in Taiwan. But uh, she was in high school. She was a senior in high school. So we were nine years apart in age. And there was no no romantic involvement or interest that we just knew just each friends. other, friends. <laughs> She came back to to the states to go to college in Tennessee, and I'm up here doing graduate work. And um, I started corresponding with her, and it just from then on, it sure. pretty soon. Uh, well, it was actually she. We dated uh, throughout her college career. Then she started teaching in Virginia, in a grade school music and then we started getting more serious and got married in 1970 in Richmond and moved into our house here I think it was Whereabouts February was on Hillcrest same oh. house okay. and a matter of fact I don't know of anybody any colleagues at least any peers of mine who have never moved and you stop and think about it it's pretty rare we have never moved from the 1000 Hillcrest 1970. Was the street when you came? Were there many houses? Was yeah, it, it was well built pretty up? well. <clears throat> see, 70. I think our house was built in 59, oh, maybe, okay. uh, something like that. Sure. So it was already 11 years old. Uh, yeah, good. There, there are parts of Sheridan and, and Western that had been built on, but Hillcrest and Summit were so pretty, pretty well. much completed by then. Was Smitty's here when you came? Yep. Okay. That's a, I believe so, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and we we bought the house for 24000 <laughs> And it's a big lot. So that, you know, that, that shows you how things have changed. 
since then. Moving forward. And that was a that was a strain for me to come up with twenty four thousand. Right. So, <laughs> but I. Uh, go ahead and go on. Continue. So you yeah you we finished. You finished. We, uh, the instructorship. Let me ask you this: Did does that include like a fact? Uh, you would sit in on faculty meetings as well. As yeah, the not voting as I recall, okay. but I was expected to go to faculty sure. meetings okay. and. The reason I asked that, and I've heard, I, I, I'm aware of that uh, position, which doesn't yeah. exist anymore, yeah. but it did at that time, as you said. Yeah, I was. I think I was one of the last. It, it sort of. I don't know why I dropped out it, as an opportunity because uh, everything became fellowships and, and you know, and teaching assistantships and, and research. researches as RAs and TAs after that. And, right. um, so. But it was perfect for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wasn't in a hurry, as I said. And so it, it took me about four years after I came here with the masters to, to get and working it. hard <laughs> right. on my research to finish. But it was okay. And then, um, um, and this was in bionic. You were in bionic. Bionicleonics. Okay. So my PhD was in bionicleonics, and Dr. Zemer was my major professor and close friend and best man at our wedding and <laughs> that sort of thing. So, What was so, the campus like when you described when you came? Well, a lot different from now, but um, there were, uh, you know, all the major, the really, to me, uh, remarkable buildings like the Union and Hubdy Hall and the Music Hall and, and the Memorial Center. They were all up. Evelyn was. Kanoi came along afterwards. Kanoi so, came yeah. along afterward. Yeah. Dr. Christian was a good friend of Mr. Kanoi's. And, um, and I got to know him a little. Sure. Great, great supporter of Purdue. So, yeah, uh, Mackey was not built. No, we that, went to, that opened in 67. You know, my basketball background, I was in heaven coming up here to see Big Ten basketball because in Texas basketball was I mean it was just really beginning football was the big sport and, and soccer didn't even exist in Texas <laughs> when I grew up so didn't exist in a lot of places yeah. <laughs> in the US so to get a chance to go see I'm trying to remember Dave Shellhouse uh, some of the Purdue greats uh, Rick Mount. No, I saw Rick Mount uh, yeah, take that famous shot against UCLA. <laughs> I don't I, know if you've heard about it. Yeah, the one the game here. The, the opening game of the Mackey Arena. Oh. Rick Mount took a shot from the corner, sort of falling out of bounds, and you know it went in. <laughs> the place erupted. It was one of his great shots. But you know, just to see. So we were over in the old Lambert Fuelhouse gym. Uh, before Mackey opened. Before Mackey. Sure. That's where I'd watch the first Purdue basketball. I'm trying to remember the coach's name, Ray King, or King was his name. Sure, right. Uh, but, yeah, it's got to see some good basketball then. And then it was but, nice uh, the nice one. Those were the major buildings mm -hmm. on campus. The quad was Kerry Quad. In fact, when I first got to Purdue, uh, well, let me go back just a bit. Mm -hmm. I uh, uh, decided, uh, you know, arranged for me to come in August. And when I came back to Idaho to get my things from the Orient from Taiwan, uh, I put everything I had in my car. <laughs> I didn't really accumulate much. Started this way, and got into Wyoming and ate some bad food and got really sick, made it into Purdue, finally, really feeling bad. And there's a little motel out on 52, it's called Green Acre, Green Hills or Green Acres, I think it's still there, that I came in and I just, you it's know. It's further out, I think. A little sure. further out past where Morris Bryant, a little <laughs> past where Morris Bryant used to be. <laughs> And I just barely rolled into there and got a room, and I, I, it took me two days to get to feeling better before I dared even 
Sure. sure. Right. And at, and I wasn't even sure where I was going to stay. Dr. Christian said something about getting me in a graduate house, you know, for a few weeks, because I had come in August before school started. In those days, I'm trying to remember, school started in like was on the almost mid September. It was quite After different, Day, and went into January before yeah, the first semester January. was over. Yeah. So coming in mid-August, there was still you know nobody around much, and so it's interesting. I I thought when I got to feeling good enough, it was on a Saturday, and I thought, okay, I'm going to go in and check out the bionucleonics area. Nobody will be around on Saturday. <laughs> So that's what I thought. So I came in like, I still remember this, come in like 9 o'clock on Saturday morning expecting to see nobody and walked into the to the bionucleonics uh, building and Dr. Christian was there, Dr. Zimmer was there, the faculty was there, students were doing research and I thought, this is Saturday. <laughs> well, you know, I don't know if you know, but in those days, there were Saturday classes, even 7.30 classes on Saturday, and the faculty was expected to be there until noon. And so everybody was in there working, <laughs> and I wasn't used to working on Saturday. <laughs> that, was, that was quite a surprise. That lasted for a few years, um, and then they stopped having Saturday classes, sure. and the faculty didn't have to come in on Saturday. But right. in, in those days, we were expected to work on Saturday morning. Mm -hmm. I don't know about librarians, but <laughs> well, they opened too. they opened hours too. Yeah, you know, yeah. it sort of because you have your Saturday. They anyway. were wean, weaning uh, the classes and got weaned out of the Saturday. They went to Tuesday, Thursday, and then Monday, mm -hmm. Wednesday, Friday. Yeah. But um, Dr. Well, Christian had arranged for me to stay in where the grad the house, grad house had, just, had was fairly new, mm -hmm. not the brick. When I not the newer one, but the younger one. But the young grad house. Uh, but that was just temporary uh, because all the rooms were taken when school started. Then I moved to Cary Quad for a couple of weeks, and then I found an apartment to stay in. Sure. So oh, you got to know the students. Yeah, too. right. <laughs> <laughs> Cary was hot then. It wasn't air conditioned. Right. I, mean, I burned up and carried, but and uh, but even the grad, as I recall, the grad house wasn't even air conditioned then. Mm -hmm. So you had to open the windows. But um, the tunnels were built, and you could get, you know, into the union. That that tunnel had been built, if I recall. And, um, but none of the parking garages were up at the time. So Gr Grant, well, Grant, Grant, this Street. yeah, this one here, but none not. Not the one that on each side of the grad house. Right, those, those are funny. those were not built. Right, and I imagine the one on Northwestern, the engineering one. Oh yeah, that was not built. Yeah. You mean on Grant and North? Grant and yeah, Northwestern. That was I'm sorry. Built later. So those, uh, that's how I got then, here, and then what and he put me to work right away in the teaching and, and uh, working with the reactor folks. Did a lot of work with the reactor in those days. A lot of different experiments were going on, um, and you know my my work in Idaho just was invaluable to me mm -hmm. for for helping out with setting up the rules and regulations and and uh, getting the reactor uh, up to where the NRC would. At that time, it was called ATC, or would you know let our license be renewed each year? So, um, well, talk it took more about, about, about health physics and the okay. school. Um, well, originally, it was entirely a graduate program, and all these fellowships were graduate masters and. And eventually the grad school, I can't remember exactly when, maybe just a year or two before I got there, approved a PhD program. Because I think it had been masters mostly. But when Dr. Zemer got here a few years before me, <coughs> Dr. Shaw and Dr. Kessler were already on board, not in health physics, but in radiation, radioisotope 
tracers. Uh, they had a pretty good qualified faculty. The grad school approved the PhD program. And that's how I was able to. Yeah, I was one of the early PhDs mm -hmm. in health physics under Dr. Zemer. And um, Dr. Christian was also able to bring in a lot of funding from the public health service. They were also looking for uh, uh, trained health physicists in, in uh, you know, uh, areas more related to medicine and um, industry that they were involved in, like the food industry was beginning to use radiation, different things. So there was a big program from the Bureau of Radiological Health. The Public Health Service established the Bureau of Radiological Health. And so they were responsible for, you know, like, uh, lasers and x-ray, uh, uh, microwaves and other kinds of radiation. And between the AEC support and the public health service support, we just, our graduate program, the first few years I was here, it just really grew. Uh, in its heyday, it had somewhere around 50. Uh, and we were packed into that. This is all funded. Uh, this is almost all government funded. Some of the Department of Defense military people were funded by their, you know, the branch of the armed services, but most of it was very little state support at that time, and, but a lot of federal support, and that lasted for quite a few years. And, you know, we just trained and educated uh, on and on close to probably a hundred or more PhDs over a period of 15, 10 or 15 years, and they're out there all over the place. So the pla where were they, what room. was placement, where were they, what, what sort of jobs were they? Well, they would go with... Uh, Government? A lot of them would go with what became the Department of Energy. Okay. Uh, a lot of them would go with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and, and regulatory work. Department of Defense would even take some civilian, you know, PhDs. And, um, state regulatory agencies would hire them, and um, oh, in some case, some of my early students, even though we didn't have the medical health physics program at the time, they they were so knowledgeable. Some of the better students actually went to hospitals. Uh, one of my first PhD students in health physics became a medical physicist, which I'll explain in a minute, because we got into that later. But he uh, got a job here at St. Elizabeth Hospital and, was the, and brought in the first accelerator that was used at St. E's. Now they're used all over Lafayette, but he brought in the first accelerator for St. Elizabeth Hospital. Now he's up in Fort Wayne at uh, Parkside. And, uh, you know, it's a real thrill to keep up with these yes, people. Yeah. Right. Try to keep up with them the best I can. They're just leaders now in the field because they're nearing retirement almost, some of them, but they're in industry and government and um, just, you know, regulatory medicine, environmental, they're really leaders. Did some of them want for an MD or, or not? M PhD, MD? Um, n I don't recall okay. any. Um, but they're working in health facilities. Yeah, uh, I've had a couple of my master's students went on to become MDs, but uh, probably didn't end up using much of their radiation safety work, because I think they didn't go into nuclear medicine, they didn't become a radiologist or oncologist, they just went into general practice as I was sure. called, but I don't believe we had any PhD MDs. So where were we? we you were going to go into health, health science or something? Yeah, we, um, we, in the 60s, look at Lance here, the it was entirely graduate program, and um, about 
early 70s, the nuclear power industry began to take off. And they actually came to us, Commonwealth Edison, it's now called Exelon, but Commonwealth Edison in Illinois in the early 70s. They were just in desperate for educated health physicists, particularly reactor health physicists. They're building these reactors all over the country, and they don't, you know, uh, they need health physicists because the requirements for their license was you've got to have a good staff of trained HPs, and they didn't know where to get them. So they came to us and asked us to start an undergraduate program. And they even, uh, they didn't really come up with a lot of funding for us because there's a there's an issue there with the fact that they're private utilities and so on. But they did um, invite me to come up. I think they were building six plants at the time. Maybe one of them was already operating, Dresden, which is near uh, up near Joliet. Um, but they were building all around Chicago to do plants. Uh, Zion, north of Chicago, LaSalle, Illinois River, uh, there's Braidwood, Byron, they were, and so they, they had, they had me go around for a couple of weeks and visit all of these plants that were in different stages of construction. Because my experience in reactors in Idaho was not nuclear power reactors, but the, all the other kinds of reactors, because they really weren't designing nuclear power reactors at that time, certainly not building them. And, uh, there, there's some major differences. Um, so I, that was invaluable. I, you know, they, they really uh, treated me well, sure. toured me around all these places, said, here's, here's, here's what's going on, here's what we need. We need people trained to handle the radioactive waste or to monitor the workers or to uh, you know, provide adequate shielding for uh, certain types of equipment. And so I came back and talked with Dr. Zemer and Dr. Christian and we decided to start a you know, Bachelor of Science BS program in health physics. And so I, I developed a reactor health physics course specific and an applied health physics course specifically for undergraduate and that program really took off and, and it's the largest in the nation and, uh, and it, it went through a period of uh, you know reactors uh, there hasn't been any new reactors approved in the US in about 20 years but that's all changing now public perception of nuclear power is making a dramatic change in the last couple of years. Uh, there's now, I think, somewhere around 20 plants that are in new plants that are in various stages of licensing. So it won't be long before uh, mm -hmm. there's going to be a resurgence in the need. But even through that period of uh, diminution of, of the need and, and reactor health physics, the need in other areas kept our undergraduate program pretty strong and, and large. And I've tried to keep up with a lot of them, you know, but it, we're talking it's about, right. talking about maybe what was the, Where were the sort of types of jobs that the students get then? So well, they... Would they go and work for a summer? Program? They used to, you know, right down the hall here is the employment or replacement center. They would come and, you know, Duke Power from, which is now up here with us, but in the, started out in Duke Power, now called Duke Energy, built a number of plants in North Carolina and South Carolina. They would come here and, and all our students had to do is walk over here and fill out. A <laughs> there was hardly, good. hardly an interview. Sure. They were so desperate. And this, this would be in the late 70s and the early 80s mm -hmm. that uh, most of our students would go into nuclear power right fresh out of Purdue they would, they would put them to work the next day 
And at one time, we had like 60 HPs from Purdue at Exelon in, in Illinois in different plants. And many of them are still there. Mm -hmm. so, okay. so that was a big boost to our, our program in terms of enrollment. And you still continue on with the graduate program. a lot of work on us. Oh, yeah. But you still continue with the graduate program, too. Oh, yeah. yeah. And not as many in numbers, although it's strong. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's morphed into some other areas now that I can talk about. Go ahead, continue. Got your notes there. Well, I might mention a couple of anecdotal okay. things that Please. were kind of interesting that I thought might be interesting for this. Yeah history. Um, when I first got here uh, in 1964, see, it'd be actually 60, yeah, it'd be, the, it'd be the fall of 64 I came. Christmas of 64, and fortunately it was the Christmas break. We had one of our worst radiation accidents, probably the worst that we've had, the worst spill on campus. It was in the physics building. And uh, it was a professor, and this is all public, of course, uh, Professor Grabowski, still around, I think. Uh, and his assistant were, uh, they, had, they had bought a uh, uh, ampule of a new radioisotope called europium from Oak Ridge, it had been produced at Oak Ridge. And uh, it had been produced in a reactor there in a, in a quartz ampule, seal quartz ampule. It had been radiated, made radioactive, shipped up here to Purdue. And uh, when they took it out in the small room in the physics building to start to open the ampule, it exploded on them, totally unexpected. And probably, we don't know exactly why it would have done that, but uh, probably had built up some pressure in the reactor of some kind. So it was in a powdered form, and uh, the powder, uh, just very fine powder, it was, it was in a small room, and it, it was in a room that had a hood, uh, but they were working out on a bench top, and so it just spread powder all over the room. And uh, they didn't quite know what to do. So they went back down a hallway and up an elevator and, and phoned Dr. Zemer. And I happened to be over at the Corec playing basketball. <laughs> so Zemer, and I don't think Dr. Zemer knew where I was, but. He responded, went over to physics, monitored them, and right away he knew we had a big problem on our hands. Uh, they were quite contaminated. And uh, so, um, and then he went down to the lab, and, and I mean, with the Geiger counter, you could pick it up in the hallways very easily. So we had to isolate, and he could finally, I came back over to, and you know, they told me about it, and I ran over there and worked with him on it. And we had to isolate quite a few hallways. It was down in the basement of the physics building because it was so highly contaminated. Uh, we had to have, take him to St. Elizabeth Hospital. And we brought in an expert from University of Cincinnati on radiation poisoning. And uh, at first they were thinking about what's called a lavage, washing out his lungs, but it's a very strenuous Thing, and they decided, no, we'll let it just work its way out because they didn't think he had the, enough that it would, you know, be uh, injurious to him to leave it in him. The risk of the lavage was apparently pretty serious at that time. Anyway. The graduate student had been standing further away and was not as badly contaminated, so we didn't hospitalize him. But uh, it's, it's, it's interesting that uh, one of my close colleagues as a student who had come here at the same time with me, one of my close friends as a student, uh, got his PhD research 
studying Professor Grabowski. And uh, uh, because at the time we had a, what's called a whole body counter, which uh, Professor Kessler was, uh, had uh, helped build. And, and it would, the person would lie in a sort of a trough and the whole thing then moved into this giant counter. Now they have them very miniaturized and very fast, but this was sort of a, and there was, all, there was a panic button. If you, you could press a button and it would send you back out. Well, uh, Dr. George, Robert George, my close friend, uh, who later became the medic, chief medical physicist at IU, he did his, he got his PhD research studying because nobody had ever in, inhaled europium before and he got his PhD research studying Dr. Grabowski you know, and uh, Dr. Grabowski very cooperative would come over every day and allow himself to be counted and so Dr. George was able to plot the excretion of europium which is a rare earth and, and it was just you know uh, very interesting new research to to people who were interested in how the body handles radioactivity of that of a rare earth. Uh, but anyway, that the cleanup was uh, where I came in, supposedly, because I had experience with a lot of spills out in uh, out in Idaho, and uh, so we. I knew a lot about how, what kind of detergents and things to use to clean up the hall. So the first thing was to, and as, again, I say it was extremely fortunate that it was during the Christmas break. There was no traffic hardly at all. And, and uh, you know, we were, and it was down in the basement anyway, so we didn't have to deal with a lot of people, um, and except curiosity seekers and that sort of thing. But, we were able to clean up the hall pretty quickly, but we knew that the room, the small little research room, was where it had occurred. Where it occurred was highly contaminated, and uh, the uh, when we decided we would build a, a plastic room uh, outside, kind of a change room, which I was used to doing out in Idaho, where you, you build a plastic room and you use it to change into your uh, and protective clothing. And so uh, and so we got all suited up, Dr. Zimmer and I, and we put our mask on and everything and scuba stuff. And, and I opened the door and I stuck the meter in there on the floor and, I, and it just, you know, the needle went way up. So we, we it took us like two weeks to just get the room where you could walk into it and work on it inside. We generated a lot of, of waste. Uh, we used Kotex, by the way. It turned out to be the best thing. Whatever well, works. You dip Kotex in, in uh, what's called a radiac wash, <laughs> and that would clean up a little, and, and uh, it worked. And, but we eventually, it was, it was more than we could handle, so we eventually hired a, a company to come in and, and gut the whole room. But that was a, one area where I was able to contribute from my knowledge from working out in Idaho. And, and you were on board, too, at that time. Yeah, available. I was on the faculty. And sure. so, And we actually used it as teaching. Uh, you know, we had grad students there, there was no undergrad program, we had grad students and they came over and we put them to work. And they learned about how to determine whether a, a surface is clean or not or what are you under the limits and how do you, what's the best way to dispose of the waste and uh, so we got it cleaned up pretty much uh, on our own except, you know, the, our physical plant really wasn't trained to come in and take out concrete that was contaminated. So we just hired a company in Pittsburgh that came in and finished it all. But, that, you know, I, I, I got... That was a good trial by fire there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, 
we also um, can I tell another anecdote here we had a again in the physics building the uh, nuclear engineering department uh, this is a few years later in the early 70s was uh, ha the concept of breeder reactors was being tossed around and the this is a different kind of reactor which sort of breeds enough fuel to keep itself going, you know, for a long time. Um, was being researched in different nuclear engineering departments. Well, uh, the nuclear engineering department wanted to install a facility in the basement of the physics building where an old cyclotron had been and been taken out. Large room there, nobody was using it. Well, this involved quite a bit of radioactive material. It involved a lot of uranium, both enriched and, and low level, and low enrichment and high enrichment. Um, and it involved a unique new isotope at the time called Californium-252. It's one of the, well, you might have heard of uh, Glenn Seaborg, the famous Nobel Prize winner at the University of California in Berkeley, who discovered California, produced it. And then they began to make it at Oak Ridge in enough quantity that it could be useful. And it, it has the ability to give off neutrons by itself. So they wanted to uh, put a blanket, as we call it, of uranium in a big circle. Actually about the size of this, a little smaller than this. Um, a lot of uranium, and then they wanted to put the California source, which was manufactured at Oak Ridge, in the middle of it. And that would, they would raise the thing up to stop the reaction and lower it to start the reaction. So when the physics department heard about this, they were not too happy with what was being suggested to be put in the physics building. So there was a number of meetings held by the physics department and they, uh, it, it went all the way up to President Hubdy and President Hubdy decided that uh, he would ask our radiological control committee, Dr. Christian, Dr. Zimmer, the rest of the committee to study it carefully and to to bring in some outside experts because parts of it were beyond our expertise. So we had many meetings over a period of uh, almost, I think, two years. Uh, we brought in a shielding expert from the University of Illinois and a criticality expert from Los Alamos in New Mexico, and they studied the design. and back and forth a lot, and finally they both gave their approval, and those were the two critical things, was it shielded enough to protect the classrooms above, and, um, you know, and, and without going into criticality, would it explode <laughs> as, as a nuclear device? And in both cases, they were satisfied with the design, and so, uh, uh, basically, President Hovde approved it, and the faculty at, at uh, physics department uh, accepted it. You know, and so we we installed. It's called the Fast Breeder Blanket Facility. It's still over there. It's not being used much anymore, as I understand it. But it was fascinating to to uh, the loading of this California source. Uh, it was a rod about three feet long. And it came, we decided we would load it on a Saturday of a Purdue football game where everybody would be over in Ross Age Stadium <laughs> and there wouldn't be anybody around the physics building. So we arranged for it to uh, arrive. It came on this big truck from Oak Ridge and it had what was called a cannonball cask. It was a cask about eight feet in diameter on this big semi. And they had loaded the, and so it's, it's a big concrete cast. Actually, it wasn't lead. It was concrete with a steel shell around it. But it's eight feet in diameter, if you can visualize it, a big cast. And 
it had an opening at the top and they had they had hooked a rope onto the top of the source so that and I was the one who uh, volunteered to reach in uh, I got up I had actually had a ladder that I leaned on the cast and I, where I could unscrew the top of the cast reach in get the rope and then uh, there's Professor Kleichman from Nuclear Engineering, you may be familiar with Frank Kleichman. He was up on the roof of the physics building with Dr. Zemer, and this is uh, three stories up on the physics building with a long rope. That, and so I tied their rope to the rope of, on top of the source. All the time, uh, I was out of the beam because I was just sort of reaching up like that. They were out of the beam simply because they were far enough away, like 30 feet away. Sure. They were being exposed, but a lot less because of distance. And so we had a chute built in the wall of the physics building that went through the wall, and it was a tube that went all the way down into the basement and fit on top of the, the uh, facility. Right. And so they raised the source up out of the cast, dropped it down into the chute, and let it go. And it slid down perfectly. But uh, that was an interesting, you know, we spent a long time practicing that drop and, you know, making the calculations. And it worked fine. And uh, uh, the facility was you know, used a lot. Mm -hmm. That was another interesting. Yeah, thing. very good. Another thing that happened seems like everything happens in the physics field. We we found a we were doing a routine monitoring of the physics building. Well, some of our technicians. All of a sudden, the meter started making a lot of noise, and so the technician kept following and figuring out where it was coming from. And there was an attic in the physics building, and somebody had. Uh, at one time, we don't know who it was or when, had used a safe, a lead safe, to store radioactive isotopes in, because you had the lead walls and the things. Good idea, <laughs> but the only problem was they had locked the safe, and we didn't know the combination. So, what do you do? You can't, you can't dispose of radioactive material unless to a low-level waste site unless you know what it is and how much. So all we knew is that there was, it was a lot of radioactivity in the safe that somebody had left on the top of the physics building. So we took it out to our waste shed and uh, turned out to be a, a really wonderful uh, exercise for students because they, they had developed a, an instrument that could measure gamma rays and measure their energy and describe to you what, and tell you what the isotope was. So we, the students took the instrument out there and figured out, and there were several different isotopes in this safe. We had an what idea. What was the size of it, approximately? The safe, oh, it was big. Oh, it, it was big. Oh, it was a big, like you see. On the floor? Mm -hmm, it, oh. was, it was heavy, several hundred pounds. Big safe. So it would have had, I can't remember how thick, but we, it was, there was a safe company out on Teal Road, or I can't forget that, Earl Avenue, Schwab, and uh, they were able to furnish us with the dimensions and the makeup of the safe, because we knew the model number. You know, we could have hired us somebody to drill through it, but that's a little risky, you know, you don't know what they're going to drill into. What's inside? Yeah. We knew what was inside, but we didn't know how much. But then, it's another good exercise for the students. They were able to uh, figure out the, uh, because they, could, they knew the thickness, then they could do some calculations and figure out how much shielding that provided. So they were able to figure out what was in it and how much. And, and, but that's <laughs> another so, thing. What did you find? Was, they were pretty accurate? Was pretty accurate? Well, yeah, I think so. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You know, it was the, at least the the uh, the waste disposal site that studied our calculations uh, 
felt that it was accurate enough that they would take it. I think it ended up in Barnwell, South Carolina, which is a big low-level waste site. It was in those days. It's mm -hmm. closed now. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, that, that was... Uh, and speaking of waste disposal, that, be, that was becoming a very big area uh, because this, this would be now in the 80s, approaching the 90s. Reactors were generating a lot of radioactive waste. Medicine was generating you know, the industry. Disposal of radioactive waste was becoming the new problem. Reactors were not being built anymore. But now you had all this, this waste, and so we began to get funding from the government to support search and radioactive waste management. So that, and that, and at the same time, radon, which you're probably familiar with, the radon was becoming a big concern, and uh, I never personally felt that it was as should have been as much a concern as it was, but there was a period when we went through quite a radon concern with the EPA. Anyway, uh, those two things prompted us to get into what's called environmental health physics, getting away from reactor a little bit more into environmental, because jobs were becoming more available there. And so I started a new course in environmental health physics, and still being taught. And we, you know, we, we graduate a lot of students in, in that area. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that my own research was getting into that area too. I was, uh, and my graduate students' research into radioactive waste management. I had a lot of students who did their PhD research in various aspects of how do you manage radioactive waste uh, when you put it into containers, how secure is the container. Uh, a lot of radioactive waste now is put in concrete vaults. If rainwater gets in you know, and leaches it out, how, how good is the concrete? So we got into that a lot. Uh, we got some support for that. Mm -hmm. uh, then uh, we, in the late 90s, uh, we began to get into a third area that I retired before it sort of reached its fruition, but it now is uh, being taught in our school health sciences, and that's medical health physics. Um, the use of radioisotopes in, in medicine now is huge worldwide, and the use of radiation has continued. I mean, you have CAT scan now, you have positron emission tomography, PET scanning, you have NMR, uh, nuclear magnetic MRI, uh, just uh, you have all kinds of accelerators that are used in cancer therapy. Well, and, and in nuclear medicine as a whole, another area, I mean, uh, it's just used, my son had a bone scan the other day because he has back problems. So they inject uh, radioactive material for bone scan. It's just routine now. Mm -hmm. Well, you've got to have somebody to receive that material in the hospital, you know, to, to protect the doctors, to protect the, the nurses, the technicians. So that, that area grew. And that was my dream, uh, to have a three-pronged approach where a student could come here, either become a reactor health physicist or an environmental health physicist, or a medical health physicist, or be trained enough, and you know, they could have his choice or her choice. And now they're, they, we have that course too, so we're pretty broad in, in within the umbrella of health physics. There are other areas, but those are the three main areas. So I think um, you know we've got to really students when they come to Purdue have a really good opportunity to get a broad health physics education. And, and the placement is good. I, yeah, I've been retired for now four years, so I don't keep up with it, but I talked to Dr. Stewart, who's sort of taking over the lead in the program, and 
seem to be. Mm -hmm. uh, this program certainly, uh, certainly maintaining its enrollment. You know, uh, so, and now with Dr. Sanderson as head of the school, George Sanderson is a head. Of, he is a medical physicist. And there's a, there's a fine, there's a difference between a medical health physicist and a medical physicist. Sometimes they're used interchangeably, but they shouldn't be. But a medical health physicist is a person at the hospital or medical center that takes care of protecting the workers and the doctors from the harmful effects. A medical physicist works is a more advanced degree, requires more knowledge in physics that actually makes sure that the machine is operating properly, delivers the right dose to the patient, and it's a, it's a much more physics-oriented degree, and you pretty much have to be a PhD to be a medical sure. physicist. Well, that's the, that's the thrust of our department now, going into medical physics under Dr. Sanderson. And actually, uh, it's, interesting that I think back in about the mid-90s, Dr. Sanderson was the chief medical physicist at IU Med Center in Indianapolis, and he succeeded Dr. George, who I had mentioned was a friend of mine who did his research on the Europium accident. And Dr. Sanderson had indicated to us that he wanted to be involved in academ academic work some, and uh, would we be interested in trying to set up a medical physics program somehow? So I started going down there, uh, meeting with him, and we began to talk about courses and so on. And then he went off to Canada, <laughs> took a job in Canada, and then Dr. Zemer uh, retired, and Dr. Krishna had already retired, and so the, the, there was an opening for the head of the School of Health Sciences. And would you, and Dr. Sanderson applied, and was became our head, school head. Sure. Still is. He's on sabbatical now, I think. But he, he's the head of the School of Health Sciences, and it's kind of ironic that you know. He was the one who really, that I worked with to set up the medical physics program, and then he comes back and leads it, and it's really, I understand, really, yeah. really a strong program, so that kind of brings us up to date. Yeah. Well, I think we've got pretty much covered today. Yeah. You think so? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Uh, Any just, closing comments? Yeah, I, oh, good. I would like to say that uh, Purdue has been very good to me. I don't know who will read this ever, but... It's been a wonderful place to work, and uh, I just, it's treated me very well. I, I'm particularly fortunate to work with the men that I worked with, uh, Dr. Zemer, Dr. Christian Shaw, Kester Warren, um, others. That we had a small department which became, a, you know, bionics became health sciences. Still a small school, the smallest school, I think, on campus. But a very congenial group of men focused on uh, what we wanted to do, but worked well together in a collegial spirit that, you know, I, I just think it was a... Uh, and one other thing that I didn't mentioned that a number of these men are also over here on the radiation safety side of the of our program. There's two parts to our program, you probably can deduce that. There's the academic part, but there's also the campus radiation safety part. And some of the men, like Christian and myself and Zemer, worked in both areas. Dr. Christian for years was head of the radio the the Radiological Control Committee for the campus, and and I still serve on that committee. I, you know, I'm retired, but I still come into the meeting and serve on that committee. 
and it is just Purdue's, I really think that Purdue's radiation safety program is second to none, you know, and they're very fortunate here because Purdue has one of the largest uses of radioisotopes of any campus in the U.S. Uh, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of faculty members who use radiation in their research, radioisotopes, and they've just been uh, a very good radiation safety program. Uh, we've had our accidents, but we, we, you know, those are unavoidable. Accidents are going to happen. We've managed them, uh, and it's just been a, it's been a blessing to me to work with, with these uh, men who, who have the university uh, at heart, you know, and have given a lot of themselves to, to this, to the safety, of the use of isotopes on campus. And so that's, you know, that's the professional side. There's also the, the joy I've had of working with some really fine people. Good. Thank you very sure. much, President. I appreciate that.